and I've been trying to set up my workspace okay. to because with the COVID, I've been I've been basically in the woodshed for all year. Okay, we're actually recording now, Arthur. Yeah, well, I'm talking for it. Okay, <laughs> <laughs> I've been in the woodshed all year. Okay. And I've been setting up my space to be somewhere where I can do the time. Yes. And I've been setting, so I put away all my instruments, you know, all the, all the little pieces that I have to use to rehearse. It was all packed away and about two hours ago, I pulled it out. And I was afraid that I, may have lost it. Well, you haven't I, lost it. <laughs> I, I was enjoying it. I said, oh, I'm Ricky Doctor, Root Doctor. I'm the hoodoo man. I'm the firstborn son of the Delta hoodoo clan. And I have got the power Get it while you can. A gift from Rick, the doctor, root doctor. I'm the voodoo man. Now, I know everything that there is to know. Secrets that you thought you had my friend you don't have no more love power money even serenity you tell me what you want my friend and i will give you what you need I am flowers of the Delta clan, flowers of the line of Oak Hill. I am hoodoo, I am griot, I am a man of power. I, my words to word, my story, true story, my lies, they are true lies. I am myth maker. And my brother Jeff and I have gathered here this evening in the name of the word, the almighty word. And when my people gather together like this in peace and love and harmony in that place, that gathering place, it is the Holy Grouse. And we would like to thank you for being with us here this evening. In the Holy Grouse. Our new digital Holy Grouse. It is I, Ricky Doc, Root Doctor, that speak in the name of the old gods, come to call you firstborn. You who walk first on two feet, humanities, living ancestors, and God's true chosen. Should not the first be the last? Listen, firstborn, to the gears of Ricky Doc, and I will give you a mission greater than your adversity. I will give you a destiny. I will give you, oh, I will give you power. Oh, I will give you power. So when you come to the crossroads, always take the high road. 
always strive to be greater than you are. If you would reclaim your legacy as God's holy instrument, you must stand on high ground. I ask only that you be the great and glorious people you were meant to be. Illuminated children of the sun. Humanity's living ancestors and God's true children. Thank you, Arthur. That was beautiful. So, Thank you. So by um, this point, everybody on the planet should know who you are, but uh, there might be a few who don't. So uh, I think one thing I might do is to break down some of that stuff, you, some of the things you told us in the invocation. Um, first of all, I would ask you, what is the instrument you're playing? For those who don't know. It's... Um... I mean, it's a, it's a kalimba, which is also called the mbiru. And, um, but it's, a, a, it's called the array mbiru. These two guys out on the East Coast invented it, hmm, maybe about eight years ago. Okay. Um, so it's still relatively rare, which means that I don't have to be but so good. <laughs> okay, so that's like a, it's like a, the Mbira, of course, is a traditional instrument from Zimbabwe. Yeah. Interesting enough, this is a connection. Um, the two previous podcasts were both about Zimbabwe in many ways. Uh, we had a conversation with Sitsi Dangarimba and, and then last week with Chris Malalazi, who you may remember from the conference we did in Ghana, you know. Yeah. And, uh, so this is like an electrified version of the Embira, is it? Well, well, yes, yes. But you know, the the I've had electrified Embiras before. They were traditional, but they were amped. Okay. So it's kind of a little more than that. Um, okay. It's got a lot of variety to it. Okay. Uh, the traditional Embiras got about maybe 10 times, maybe about 20 at the most. This one has what, a hundred and something? Oh, okay. So, you know, I mean, I, I can basically play, play it like a keyboard. Oh, okay, I see. Wow, that is amazing. And in your invocation, you uh, talked about your lineage and one name you mentioned is O'Killens. Uh, some may not know the work of John O'Killen. So maybe you could talk about him and why O'Killens is important to you and why you come from him. Baba John Killen, um, the great griot master of Brooklyn. There was something about him that spoke to me as a kid. Um, I, I ran across and then we heard the thunder which was a novel he wrote about <clears throat> black soldiers during World War II. Also read a book of his called The Cotillion. And this was when I was a youngster in Memphis and it was reading, you know, and I had been exposed to like uh, Baldwin, Wright, et cetera. But it was reading John O'Killen that made me feel the connection with literature. Okay. And, uh, <clears throat> and I was a kid. And, but, but that was when I was like, I'm gonna be a writer one day. And you know, I never moved on it because in Memphis in the 60s and 50s, I mean, a kid thinking I'm gonna be a writer, a black kid thinking I'm gonna be a writer one day was a fantasy. Um, it, you know, even though Richard Wright had come through, but hell, we didn't know that. Anyway, um, uh, but then one day I was taking, I was taking uh, photos for Push Memphis of Nikki Giovanni. And this was after I'd been in Vietnam and I wanted to tell the story of black soldiers in Vietnam. Um, Cause that was an experience like nothing else I had ever known. Yeah. And, um, 
And I felt like, okay, I want to tell this story. It's time for me to write. And I sat down to write, and this was like 69, I guess, maybe 70, and nothing happened. And I had always thought, man, one day I'm going to be, I, you know, and I pointed at the typewriter and expected pages to just flow. And, okay. uh, <laughs> and nothing happened. So I went out to uh, the University of Memphis. I got in a workshop and they were like crap. They were like characters and plot. And I was like, fuck, this is a crap. We have some verbs. <laughs> <Right. laughs> uh, but one day the, the teacher pulled me aside. He said, look, you know, he said, look, you know, you got it. Uh, you stick with me, I'll make you a star. And I was like a star, but I didn't want to be a star in Memphis. I wanted to be a star in New York City. Right. <laughs> so, you know, right. I, yeah. was, I was talking, Nikki Giovanni, I was taking photos of, I said, Nikki, are there any workshops in New York? She said, yeah, Sonia's doing one at the Schoenberg and John Killens is at Columbia. Okay. I said, John Killens, I thought he was dead because I'd never heard about him anywhere else, you know, except I read right. it. She said, no, he's at Columbia and wherever John teaches, he stipulates that his workshop will be open to the community. Okay. So I, I was like, fuck, you know, I, I mean, I told all my buddies, I'm going to New York City, I'm going to get in John Killen's workshop, I'm going to get a Nobel Prize, and I'll be back for the fall. <laughs> <laughs> so nice. I went to New York, John was in China, I had to decide, do I stay in New York or do I go back home after I talked all that shit, you know? Right. <laughs> and uh, and uh, so I, I stayed in New York, I got in his workshop. The first workshop, he said, you overrode it, but you carried it through with sheer artistry. I oh, was wow. like, okay, I'm that's it. I'm done, you know. Right. <laughs> and um, and I followed him from school to school for 16 years. So what kind of person was he as a teacher and as a mentor? Well, you know, I mean, folk ask me when they say 16 years, what did you what could you possibly have been learning for 60 yeah. years? And the thing was that not only did John teach me how to be a writer, I mean, teach me how to write. Not only did he teach us how to write, because there was a whole cadre of us that followed him from school to school. Yes. Not only did he teach us how to write, he taught us how to be writers. Okay. And, and then as we evolved and became, you know, published. He taught us how to promote and how to distribute. As we became established, he taught us how to be visionary. Because okay. that was his thing, being long distance runners. And he would, because he came out of that Marxist thing, you know. So okay. he was like, oh, we got to build institutions for 100 years from now, for 200 years, 200 generations from now. We got to build institutions for generations unborn. Okay. And, and and I interpreted that as the long game, shaping right. generation. Uh, right. So you've he, certainly done you certainly built some institutions yourself. Yes. Your work, your uh, Renaissance workshop and, and so on. You know, you try. Yeah. You try. All you can do is try. Yeah, I think we we've, we've been trying to do that. Um so uh is it fair to say that, uh, well, I want to talk some about your experiences as a soldier in Vietnam, um, um, because it might be fair to say that uh, you were following Achilles' footsteps by going to Vietnam, because you actually, you weren't drafted, you enlisted, didn't you? Yeah. Well, you didn't have to tell everybody. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I didn't know you were going to be snitching me out of here. <laughs> Well, it's an interesting fact, I think. It should yeah. be out. Okay. Uh, yeah, you know, looking back, it, it was it was John's influence. Um, that's and that's why I say. And going to New York, the Cotillion was all about a, a young writer, black writer in Brooklyn. And oh, okay. Um, and uh, and I didn't realize it at the time. Of course, I just thought I was. I wanted to get out of Memphis. I wanted adventure. <laughs> yes. And, uh, and, and, and I had a thing about being a paratrooper, about jumping the big iron bird. Um, so you were a paratrooper? Yeah, man, I was with the 80s. And so, okay. and it was so funny, because, <laughs> uh, you know, okay, so at first I tried to hitchhike to Chicago, because there, there was a woman in Chicago. 
Okay. <laughs> so me and my boy, we caught the, the we tried to hobo the Chicago. Okay. I'm telling you, I was just lost in romance, romance in the romance of getting out, you know, on the road. And so, uh, but we didn't know how to hobo. We 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 ended up spending the whole day going from one train station, you know, one yard to the other. Okay. <laughs> we went deep in the Mississippi before we, you know, need to catch it north. And so anyway, I ended up about, oh man, I was part of the Memphis State 109, which was this, uh, we took over the dean's office, I, bye, bye. And um, so, you know, we were supposed to go to court after they got us out, all of the, the, the folk got us out of jail. And um, instead of going to court, I went to the army. Okay. And um, and so, um, but you know, I didn't have to. Looking back, you know, I didn't have to. Okay. Um, so I went down to the to the uh, recruiting office, and in during the Vietnam War, if you volunteered, you were able to choose where you would be stationed. Okay. So they would say, all oh, your M MOS, which was your job thing. And so uh, they said, well, what do you want? I said, I want to be airborne. And they looked at each other like, what, where did this fool come from? <laughs> okay. <laughs> they looked at each other like, yeah, we can do that for you. <laughs> okay. <laughs> oh, well. Uh... <laughs> So how many oh, yeah. how many jumps did you do? Oh, you know, I, mean, I jumped I jumped regular, and uh, but but then what happened was when I got to Vietnam, right? And I mean it was just a a, a clusterfuck from the beginning. Okay. Uh, at first they sent me to Fort Campbell. I did basic training, and then they sent me to Fort Knox for radio operator school. Okay. But in radio operator school, you could move at your own pace. Yes. I got out of radio operating school in about a week. It was a six week program. You know, like it was anyway. And so they said, oh, hell, we're going to send you to cryptographer school. OK. Wow. And by that time, they had kind of realized that, you know, I, I was that they, anyway, they said, look, we want to send you to OCS. And because uh, they were looking for black officers, you know. Yeah. So OCS for those of, for those of us who don't know what that means, uh, officer candidate school. Okay. Yes. So uh, and then they got my COINTELPRO report. Oh, okay. I see. We and it's like <laughs> we're not sending you to officer school. We're not sending you to no goddamn cryptographer school either. And there were only three schools on Fort Knox, so okay. they were only they were going to have to send me to Cook School. And being a cook was like, you know. Right, right. Cook. And the LERP school, and the LERPs were long range reconnaissance patrol. They'd be riding around on the back of the Jeep with the 50 caliber like, Oh, you know, right. And they wow. get behind enemy lines and shit. And I was like, oh, fuck, you know. <laughs> 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 right. They sent me to clerk school, you know. Okay. okay. And uh, so I was a clerk. And I got through clerk school quick too. And uh, so then I got to Vietnam, right? And uh, and so I'm airborne. And uh, but by then, by this time, I got a big old afro. Okay. Right? I'm like Lieutenant yeah. Flap, you know. Right. <laughs> and, uh, and the guy, the guy who was assigning us in Vietnam said, Look, you can't go airborne with that afro. So you got to cut that afro. I said, I'm not cutting my afro. What you gonna do? Send me to Vietnam? Right. <laughs> <laughs> and he was saying, I'm not gonna send you to the airborne with that afro. He said, you're gonna stay right here. And okay. right here was USAV. It was the United States Army Vietnam. It was the headquarters for Vietnam. General Rest Moreland was right down the street. Man, I was really good. Oh, wow. And so, you know, he, and I'm looking back, I realized that he was like, I'm not gonna let this idiot go into the bush, you know, yeah. he, he kept me there at Yusabi, which was like working, you know, at the Pentagon. So you may have saved your life in some ways. Oh yeah, man. And, yeah. Um, and, uh, but I didn't stay long at Yusabi because, you know, I was still a, a fuck up. Right. <laughs> <laughs> I was still a disobedient motherfucker, you know, with a yeah. afro. 
And, uh, and and then I saw this guy walking around Long Bend and he had a beard. And I was like, man, how you get a beard? He said, I dry shaved until my face bumped out. Man, I dry shaved, so I had a beard and a big old afro. Uh, you know, I was, I remember this one time, this black lieutenant stopped me. He said, he said, soldier, you a disgrace. He said, who are you? I said, flowers, head and head, first of the five. He said, oh, you, and walked off. <laughs> oh, what? <laughs> I, I, I had a good Wow. Anyway, um, so I got sent to the 38th BPO, which was like the mass unit of Vietnam. It was where they sent all the fuck ups. Okay. Uh, and, and, and my captain was like, my captain got fragged. Oh, wow. Yeah. And I used that in my first novel. Yeah. Because uh, he got fragged by accident. Oh. The guy was trying to get the supply side. So what he did was he put a grenade uh, under the, because and frag means fragmentation grenades, because you know they don't right. need a lot of evidence. And so uh, he put the frag grenade under a sand bag in front of the ammo bunker. So whoever would open the ammo bunker was gonna blow up half the fucking post. Wow. Um, and so the new captain had just come in country and, and like I said, we were the, the fuck up unit. Our captain was, he had these big old handlebar custom mustaches and he was wow. a hippie. You know? Wow. <laughs> and, uh, and, uh, and so he was showing the new captain around. They went to the ammo bunker. The company clerk called the captain, said, uh, we need you, are you getting a phone call? He turned around, walked back. The new captain pushed open the ammo bunker and he didn't die. Uh, the fucking uh, the explosion. Wow. And uh, and they got the guy because he had just gotten on the Freedom Bird going home. But he had wow. told us that he was going to bl blow up the ammo bunker. Wow. So I used that for my, in my first novel. Yeah. So uh... and basically, one more thing yeah. about Vietnam before we move on. Because what Vietnam did was it blew my young mind. Yeah. Uh, um, before I had always thought of history as happening to other people, other places, other time. But Vietnam, I realized, damn, I'm in the middle of history. Right. Um, and that's when I realized that history is always now. Yeah. That, that, that whatever we do, and it's the history of the future, and right. that we should shape it to our liking. And in some ways, that's part of the idea of African time, I think, which is the notion that the past, the present, and the future exist all at once. You know, it's all I can see, which is a way of how I think about time in many ways. And, and I call that eternity. Eternity, you know, when yeah. In that timeless moment when it's, when you just experience in past, present, future, everything in, in an instant. Yeah. So, um, a couple of more things about me and I want to ask you, but uh, is it fair to say that there's still been relatively little writing from black soldiers who were in Vietnam? Oh, no, man, there's a whole lot of work about uh, black soldiers in Vietnam. Uh, I, I wouldn't say, well, I shouldn't say there's a lot, but there are quite a few. Um, not, not all fiction. Uh, you got Blue's Child Baby. Right. Um, and you got some other works that aren't as, that didn't make the cut, shall we say. Right, well, you know, there've been probably hundreds of novels by white writers about Vietnam. Um, yeah, well, there weren't a lot. You know, uh, there weren't, I mean, it's just like, I mean, you know, with 10% of the population, we're gonna be 10% of, of the Vietnam novels. You know? Right, right. And, um, and plus that, most of the guys in Vietnam, mm, 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 mm. Um, you know, weren't into writing. I yeah. was not into writing. They used to call me the professor in my unit because I read a lot of books. Oh, okay. And this is something that um, some people may not know, which is that you consulted on Spike Lee's Vietnam movie, The Five Bloods. Uh, I don't know if you have anything to say about that. I'm, I'm curious to know what that experience was like. He brought you over to Vietnam, I would assume, and 
No, it was, was Cambo, no Thailand. It was oh, shot Thailand in Thailand. Did you? Uh, it was an amazing experience. Um, did you? Did you go back to Vietnam from Thailand? Or they went and they asked me if I was interested. Uh, but you know, I was teaching me, and I'd already taken like two, three weeks off. You oh, know, okay. From the semester, I was like, no, I, I can't go to Vietnam with you. And okay. you know, it was so funny because you know, they were like. You know, can <clears throat> come and spend a month with us in Thailand. I was like, man, I can't just take a month off, you know. Right. <laughs> and and, uh, and uh, what about two weeks, you know? And they said, okay. I said, so I went to the schoolhouse. I said, look, you know, uh, the Spike Lee is asking me to, you know, be in the movie. They said, go ahead and take a month. <laughs> okay. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Because they cool. like me to be out there, you know. That's part, right. as you know, that's part of the sale. Right. And. Uh, but yeah, I, but I just couldn't. I looked at the, you know, what I had my students doing. I just couldn't take a month, so I took two weeks, and um, or was it three? And uh, and it, I enjoyed it immensely. Enjoyed it immensely. It, it was very complicated. Uh, okay, so I got there. At first, I didn't believe them. You know, when right. they called me and said, you know, <laughs> but this guy had told me he was going to tell Spike to bring me over. You know? Okay. And so I didn't believe he was going, you know, I was like, yeah, yeah, cool. And then I got the call from the producers and they were like, yeah, can you come over, you know, tomorrow? Wow. <laughs> Thailand? I said, hell yeah. Okay. <laughs> I okay. said, no problem. <laughs> okay. And I said, what about my, you know, passport and visas and everything? They said, we're going to take care of all that. Just, just you be at the airport. You know, okay. it, may, it may have been the day after. It was like right away though. And so, uh, and I said, wait just a minute. Y'all ain't said nothing about no money. Yeah. <laughs> you know, what kind of money we talking about? They said, we think we're going to give you a couple of thousand dollars. I said, a couple of thousand dollars. I said, maybe Hollywood a couple of thousand dollars different from a literary couple of thousand dollars. Right. <laughs> I know damn well you don't think I'm going to get on a plane to Thailand to work on the Spike Lee movie for two fucking thousand dollars. I couldn't even tell my friends that all y'all paid me was two thousand right, right. Oh, man. I, I, I was like, oh, hell no. You know. And they still didn't give me, because I was expecting life changing money. Right, right, right. <laughs> Right. I think we all expect that from Hollywood. Yeah. $2,000. I told, I'm not, I don't, I, told, I don't go down the street for $2,000 anyway, even though I do, but I wasn't telling right. them that. You know? Right. <laughs> <laughs> and so, uh, so I got to Thailand, right? And then, you know, they put us up in a magnificent hotel. And, uh, and so they said, uh, look, you want to go to the, to the, uh, to the set? I said, you know, you tell me what I want to do. Right. And uh, and so, and, and basically, I, you know, basically I was brought over to just tell them what the black experience in Vietnam was like. Okay. So I got down to the set and it was like they had built up a whole city. You know, wow. every, every set was like a whole new city. Wow. And uh, I mean, you know, with the construction cranes and blah, 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 blah. And right. then the, the, the scene would, I, mean, I looked at the movie, the scene was about two minutes. Oh, wow. You know, all day, yeah. new city, anyway. Wow. So I got down there and it was lunchtime. And, and, and no, they called, they said, Spike, do you want him to come down? He said, they said, yeah, send him down. Spike said, yeah, send him down. So I got down there. And, uh, and I'm sitting there, I'm eating lunch. Oh man, they put a good meal on. They took really good care of it. it okay. Was, <laughs> it, it was a great meal, you know. And so I'm sitting, and it was, it was like one line if you wanted a Western meal, one line if you wanted a, a Thailand meal. Anyway. Okay, I love Thai food. Like, yeah, that was great. Yeah. And uh, anyway, so anyway, <laughs> so Spike came up to me, you know, and we sat at a table. And, uh, and you know, I'm gonna tell you, I expected Spike to be an asshole. Oh, okay. Not, yeah. not because I thought anything, but just a basic, you know, I'm full of myself, Hollywood stuff. Hollywood type, right, yeah. yeah. But he was so cool. Uh, yeah. He was very, you know, he's very awkward. He's very socially awkward. Oh, okay. He was very, you know, he was endearingly awkward. And it was so funny, because he said, what about those Knicks? Because, you know, that was all he knew to talk about was sports. Right. And I was like, 
I don't know shit about sports. <laughs> okay. <laughs> I told him I do not follow sports. I don't know what season it is. Yeah. I don't know shit about sports, you know. And so we just sat there. Yeah. <laughs> and, uh, but, you know, we talked. And uh, and like I said, you know, uh, I found him to be very human. So, uh, and then I was introduced to the cast. And also, once again, I expected them to be, you know, full of themselves. But, man, yeah. they were so cool. They were really, really cool. Uh, what's his name? Um, Delroy Lindo. Yeah, man, that's exact. Right. Yeah. So he came up. He said, "I'm Delroy Lindo." I said, "I know who you are." <laughs> okay. <laughs> I'm a big fan of yours. <laughs> yeah, he's a, he's a great actor. <laughs> I was once yeah. at a party with you at, oh. in the Hollywood Hills. I said, "You probably didn't notice me there." <laughs> right. Because <laughs> <laughs> yeah. uh, he lived in L.A. for a long time. Yeah. yeah, so it went like that. And they were so cool, and we had our little discussion. And, uh, you know, and I just told them about being a black soldier in Vietnam. I didn't really, I, oh, so I told Spike, I said, you know, man, uh, my contribution would be a lot stronger if I saw the script. Right. He said, yeah, yeah. So he had him send me a script. It was so funny because it had my name on every page just in case I tried to sell it. You know? Oh, really? <laughs> you know, <it's> awesome. <laughs> on every page. Wow. Anyway, so I read the script, you know, and I was like, hmm. I said to Spike, I said, man, I said, this is not exactly the way I would tell the Vietnam story. OK. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, if anybody's seen the movie, it's, it's unfortunately, it's a pretty awful movie. Yeah. Said, well, no, I'm not going to go there. <laughs> right. <laughs> yeah. But I said, you know, this, I would I would have told this differently. But you know, it, I mean, they were already in shooting. Why do you think he? Uh, well, why do you think they brought in you? You so well, late? Because and... it's part of Spike's thing, I think, because there were other folk there who had different expertises. Okay, would have speak to you know in, in a meeting with the cast. I think like the movie was actually written by uh, some guys who are known for writing for writing games. You know. Um, like well, those games. So at one point, I, so I was, you know, every day I was on the set because they were interested. Man, we'd be in rice paddies one day. Next day we'd be like in this weird alley. Anyway, um, and so, but I didn't have any roles, so I was just standing there. And right. then one day I met this guy who was just standing there too. And we standing there, you know, talking to each other and, and, and communing. And I learned that he was the script writer. Oh, okay. And um, and he told me about, you know, how, how it came about. They it was a script, it was really originally just a script about to some white guys finding gold. Oh, okay. And they redid it, you know, and you know, Spike don't believe in nuance. Right. <laughs> you know, <laughs> and so uh, <laughs> And so, uh, and so, and so, but at one point, so, so he basically ignored my, you know, and I mean, I yeah. wasn't there to give suggestions, or, you know. Well, that would be the thing, like, if, if I, well, you know, if I were going to make a Vietnam movie, if I had that luxury, I would, uh, it, it would occur to me to hire people like you and other Black uh, veterans to work on the script, I mean, to, you know, to do it from scratch that way, as well, opposed you know, to go from the that, other that, direction. That, that, that's kind of easy to say in back, what's the name? He right. brought me in when he learned of me, and they had read the book. Yeah, but they, they had been assigned the book. Yeah, but you know, man, I hear what you're saying, but you know, I, I, I came out of there with a lot of respect for what they do. Right. And once again, it's not how I would have told the story, but it's, you know what I'm saying? Right. Um, and, uh, and Spike showed me respect. Right. When right. folks show me respect, I give them respect back. You know what right. I'm saying? Right. I know what and, you mean. And, and, I, and I give them benefit of doubt. Uh, yeah. Spike showed me respect. The cast showed me respect. The, 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 all of the folk who worked on the movie showed me respect. Right. And, uh, and, and so I got to give respect back. And, yeah. uh, and I'm not going to put the movie down. It wasn't the movie I would have written. Hell, right. the movie I would have written would have been a version of my book. Right. <laughs> right. <laughs> you know? 
And so right. anyway, though, talking with Kevin, Kevin Wilmot, was an education. That's the right the screenwriter. Yeah, that was the screenwriter. He had yeah. also written uh, Black Klansman. Oh, and you, okay. Yeah. And he was talking about the fact that because he had gotten a Oscar or whatever they get uh, for Black Klansman, they were going to let him do his own movie. Oh, okay. You know, the wow. powers that be. And yeah. green lighted him doing it, doing his own movie. Wow, uh, so he cool. was really excited. Yeah. And at one point, Spike asked me and Kevin to do script doctoring on the script. We didn't make it better. Okay, <laughs> you know? all right. Because, yeah, Spike had this, it may have been, uh, damn, what's his name? God damn it. Uh, he's like, his name is to see. And he wrote, oh, fuck, he's one of the old classic black writers. And oh. he wrote a book on black slang. Oh, oh, um, I wish I could remember who you're talking about. You know who I'm talking about. It's not, it's not um, Clarence Major, is it? Exactly. Yeah, exactly. Clarence Major, right. And he wrote a book on black slang. And right. so he had us go through the black slang book and put as many slang beats into the, the script as we could find room for. I'm going to tell. <laughs> I'm going to tell Clarence that, in fact. <laughs> but while we so one e one evening slash night, Kevin and I are working on the script, and it was like a master class in screenwriting. Because okay. you know, I'd suggest something, and Kevin would be like, "Hmm, you know, on the screen, it's got to be readily apparent." Right. You, know, you can't be doing as much of that literary, you know, it's got to right, be right. readily apparent. Um, I, I just learned so much working with Kevin on that script. Because movie writing is much about the dialogue, among other things. Sir. Absolutely. And so yeah. doing all of those old school 50s <laughs> slang really didn't help the dialogue. Right, right. You may have noticed. <laughs> right. <laughs> yeah. Well, anyway, it was it was a good effort on Spike Lee's part. Um, some people may not know what a doctor is, so I think uh, you are a doctor in the hoodoo sense. Uh, I was talking to someone about hoodoo the other day. They asked me, well, well what is hoodoo? So, <laughs> so I'll ask you. <laughs> hoodoo is part of a family of Afro-spiritual retentions in the Americas. Most of them are fusions of African religions and Catholicism. You got Vodun in Haiti, which is a fusion of Fon and Catholicism. You got Santeria in uh, the Spanish speaking countries, which is a fusion of Yoruba and Catholicism. In Brazil, you got Mokumba and Cotomble, which is a fusion of, of uh, Congo and Catholicism. Uh, and they are mostly religious systems. In the Americas, uh, Black folk were not allowed to practice their religions. Remember, they was like, no, nah, hell, your name, your name ain't no fucking Kunta Kente, your name Tony. Right. <laughs> <You know? laughs> and and so, so they forgot the gods, but they kept the rituals. And so if you keep the rituals without the gods, basically you got magic. Um, right. And there were two practitioners who were brought over from Africa. There were the priests and the sorcerers. The priests were above ground, so they were repressed. The sorcerers were already under, the, well, they were already subversive. Right. Uh, so sorcery became the major Afro-spiritual retention in the Americas. Most of the, the, the revolts were led by, in the early part, they were led by, uh, by, you know, Gullah Jack and right. Mom Betty, Mama, the the woman in Jamaica. Who am I thinking of? Mama, somebody. Right, right. I know what you mean. Yes. Yeah. And so, um, but then as they got more acculturated to Christianity, they began using Christian tropes. You, Nat Turner, Denmark Vesey. Uh, anyway, but they were still the 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 leaders of basically the Afro-spiritual way in the Americas. Okay, and now when folk hear the word hoodoo, they generally think in slavery time hoodoo, they think in spells, hells, and black cat bones. Right. And, and, and there was, my mama used to tell me half my 
family back in North Carolina, they make do consultations. The other half won't make a move without one. But that generation turned their back on hoodoo. They, oh, see. they thought it was evil. You know, yeah. they said, they said, you know, it's African, it's evil. Okay, so it wasn't until the 60s, the black arts, black, uh, the black scholarship, what it, you know, the black, uh, Black, black, the, the scholarship. The aesthetic and all that. But yeah, yeah, you know, anyway, until folks started studying African religion that we started kind of understanding what the process. Anyway, so round about the 20th century, African-American writers and artists started using hoodoo as literary ground, starting with Charles Chestnut and the Conjure Woman Tales, but really going back to the slave narratives where, you know, all through the slave narratives, they talk about uh, practices. Right. Um, but Charles Chestnut kind of was the first one to really use it as a literary ground. And the then you had yes. Zora Neale, who was like a trained anthropologist who kind of studied it as an anthropological, literary, mythical ground. Yes. And, then, and um, then you got Ish Reed during the 60s, who did mumbo jumbo. And I tell my students when I teach literary hoodoo that mumbo jumbo transformed African American literature yeah. uh, and African American culture. Because before mumbo jumbo, pretty much all your, your, your major literary voices were Christians. After and even <laughs> Israel had the whole neo hoodoo aesthetic, in fact, the whole aesthetic. Yeah. But Ishmael changed, Ishmael changed the culture uh, because after Ishmael, Ishmael with his satiricism, he ridiculed the alternative ideological constructs because there was like cultural nationalism, which Ishmael's neo hudu was part of. Right. Then there was Marxism, Islam, and Catholicism. He makes fun of all those. Of the oh, books. he made fun of them so bad, yeah. <laughs> you know, that, you know, folk were like, okay, you know. And well, I remember folk were like, God's going to strike Ishmael dead. Well, there's <laughs> one of my uh, favorite moments in one of Ishmael Reed's novel. There's a scene where where Jesus gets off the cross and then he says, free at last, you know. <laughs> so yeah, that, You know, it, it, when you poets do fiction, and I'm counting you, <laughs> yeah, okay. it, it, it's like it's it's major yeah. it's major so 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 the current uh who do uh the cutting edge of who do has moved into the prophetic okay prophetic um, yes trying to because wow in the family of afro spiritual retentions who do has been the 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 bastard child it lost more of its African nature than the others, just like African Americans did. It's right. been the bastard tradition of a bastard culture. Yes, it's very accretive. It just uh, it it adopts itself to every little piece of culture that it finds uh, that that it thinks is worthwhile. Uh, so now, what those of us I call it high who do to distinguish it from folk who do and folk magic because uh, because you know who's got time for folk magic when we yeah. were folk people folk magic was fine but and um uh um so anyway it, it's trying to be the prophetic coach the prophetic tradition of the afro spiritual family so it sounds like you were that you can't well you said uh that there were some of these, some of this was in your family already, but it sounds like you came to Hoodoo through literature. Is that yeah, fair to say? Yeah. Absolutely. And that's why I'm a different kind of practitioner. Okay. You know, once I, once I, once mumbo jumbo opened my eyes and then, you know, you read Mama Day, you read your boy Weidman, the cattle killing, yes. you know, it, 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 then your idea of, 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 of where hoodoo is and where Afro spiritual practice is operates on a different level. Yeah. Um, and in the hoodoo world, I am often referred to as a theorist and yeah. it is not a measure of <laughs> respect. <laughs> okay. Uh, All right. Uh, 
So <laughs> well, exactly what do you mean by that? It's not a measure of respect being called a oh, theorist. You know, if you're not out here doing spells and oh, I see what love you're potions and shit okay. like that, then, you know, <laughs> okay. you know, act like you're not a real hoodoo. You know, oh, okay, I, I see. No goddamn spells and love potions. And, uh, yeah. that, that, but, I don't have time for that. But they have, uh, they have actually hoodoo conventions and things of that sort, don't they? If they do, I don't, I'm not familiar with it. Oh, they don't. Okay, I thought yeah. you were. I thought you were, had attended uh, some hoodoo gatherings of that sort. Oh, the one that I've attended is the one that I put on. Oh, okay. I didn't know that. All right. <laughs> yeah. No. I so I had gotten this thing at Syracuse. It was like a faculty semester off, and you know, just so I could work on my the hoodoo book of flowers. And as yes. part of it, I was supposed to do a presentation or at least bring somebody in to do a presentation. Yes. Instead, I, I hustled up some more money and I contacted about 11 of the strongest hoodoos I know. Yeah. You know, I mean, the may, including like the hoodoo queen of our era, Mama Hoodoo. And, okay. uh, and folk like Snake 2G, who, you know, is Melvin Gibbs, who's like a bass player who's like one of the major bass players in the world, but okay. we know him as Snake 2G. And, uh, and and not only is he a major bass player, but he his hoodoo physics, are, uh, is he does physics on a level that MIT brought him in to be a, they, they kept him there for to be a, you know, to just lecture on hoodoo physics. Oh, wow, that's amazing. Yeah. So has I brought, he written a book about this? Huh? Has he written a book about this? He no, he's a bass player, man. He yeah, just plays. You no, know, that's how yeah. he, it's his thing. That's his thing. So yeah. I'm trying to get a book out of him. Right, right. <laughs> but you know, this is how he this is how he, you know, communicates. Yeah. And so uh, but I brought in eleven folk of this caliber. Okay. And they were all performers. So not only did we do a panel that blew, and we major kind of, you know, they were like, wow, you don't usually get this kind of uh, attendance. So we did a panel, and the only problem was with 11 high hoodoos, I should have had, that should have been an all-day conference. Right, right. It should have been an all-day conference. Man, they didn't hardly get time to get started before they had to, you know. Oh, okay. <laughs> and. Um, but then we performed that night, man. And, uh, and the guy who was supposed to be taping it messed it up. Oh, wow. But boy, you know, it was, it was, it was, it was a gathering of hoodoos. It sounds amazing. It yeah. was. Yeah. Well, and you know, said, I, man, one day somebody's going to pay me. Uh, speaking of the, of the Book of Flowers, uh, I remember you, we, as you were working on the book, I remember you describing it as a holy book. Yeah. You know? And uh, if to me, when I read it, it, uh, it, it it's one of those kinds of books that you can, you can indeed read like the Bible. You can read in bits and sections and just uh, absorb the wisdom uh, from a particular passage. I think that's quite amazing, you know. Um, and you said it's, um, from what I'm understanding, it's, it's garnered attention from other hoodoos and people who are doing spiritual work. Well, you know, it was designed like that, man. It was designed to be a divination. Yes. Basically, like the the I Ching is probably the the holy the sacred text that influenced me most. Okay. Um, uh, and it's and, and you know the Ile Ifa whatever it's you know I don't know Ifa right yeah but it but their text the the text they use to do their divinations. Um, so, okay, so I decided I wanted to write a holy book. Uh, I look at the condition of black people around the world. Yes. Everywhere, we are on the bottom of our respective society, everywhere. Yeah. So, you know, we can't blame everywhere on other people. We, we got to kind of, you know, somehow, some way, we got to transform the weaknesses that have crippled us in global competition. Yes. Uh, I look at uh, the condition of black folk in America. We tried everything, you know, 
revolution, the assimilation, the economics, politics, you know, personal achievement, man, we, we, and we're still the bottom feeders. Yeah. Uh, I have decided that I have to transform America, I mean, Black America, so deeply. I got to make them a different kind of people. Okay. Um, uh, I look, okay, so I got like, what, 67, well, I'm already done, say, I turned 70 this year. I got 90 years, maybe, on the planet, you know. Yes. Uh, I figured the best use of my time is to do, you know, because and, and I talk about, you know, um, as a root doctor, when I make a move, I want it to really change things. I don't want it to be a bullshit move that doesn't really change things. It's got to right. change. So I look at I look at the, I look at historical destinic dynamics and the th what changes things more than anything are holy books. I look yes. at the Bible, I look at the Quran, I look at the I Ching, you know, it's like, ooh, I want to write a holy book. And so right. uh, I was like, okay, so I was strung out on cocaine. And I left New York, fleeing. Anyway, yes. around about Oklahoma, I, uh, I'm broke, I read a watchtower, a watchtower. Jehovah Witnesses. Yes. Yeah. And it talked about holy books. And it said a new holy book, a new tradition has to do this, this, and that. It has to be a, a brand new uh, understanding of our relationship with God. It has to try to save everybody. It has to do this. Oh, man, it just laid it. And, and I wrote all of them down right then and there. And it was like, this what I want to do. And yeah. so, um, so I wrote the Hoodoo Book of Flowers, and it took me about 20, 25 years. Okay. okay. Um, but it is my would-be holy book. And at first I tried a biblic format. That didn't work for me. Mostly because basically the Bible is not a, whole, a book. It's a damn library. Right, <laughs> you know, right, right. It's a lot of books. Anyway, right. and um, okay. So then I tried the, 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 the Quran as a model, but the Quran structure is biggest to smallest or smallest to biggest you know it's not a structure that it's not a, a structure i could use anyway right. so finally i realized that if you want to write a holy book there are no because they, i try to eat ching format you, you, you just can't use other folks formats you know you you got to come up with something that's kind of particular to your culture right um so I, I came up with this whole divination thing you know because i was really envious of the baba laos and, 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 you know, Aoife divination. And, uh, and so I, I came up with a divination structure uh, and one of those kind of structures, and, and I'm a flash fiction person. So it was like flash fiction beats. Okay. You know, flash yeah. fiction, nonfiction. And at the same time, I'm writing a book. I'm studying wisdom tale traditions because I, I'm not, a, as you may have noticed, it's full of tales. Right. Uh, and, and oral oral work and yeah. I had at first I was using African American oral tradition stuff. Then I found this wonderful book of 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 of, of African fairy tales. Oh, okay. It's called yeah. African Fairy Tale Analogues. Okay. You know, and it was like, man, it was just amazing. It had you know it was all the princes and princesses and kings and organs and you know <laughs> the whole thing from Africa. Right. And it was like a lot, and I got a lot from that book. But then, and, and but but at the same time, I'm trying to forge a wisdom tale tradition, and and I wasn't getting a lot of wisdom tales. Okay. So, I started studying the wisdom tale traditions of all over the world. You know, the Hasidic wisdom tales, the Hindu wisdom tales, the Buddhist wisdom tales, the Zen, and the Sufi wisdom tales. Not all Sufis. I, I, I had I, I found major major empathy with the Sufi tradition. Okay. And at the same time I'm trying to figure out what kind what am I trying to build a hoodoo tradition as the new hoodoo tradition because basically I'm trying to establish myself as the model of the hoodoo future. Okay. And so do I want that to be a religious tradition? No. 
Do I want it to be a magical tradition? Well, a high magic tradition, a wisdom tradition. So Sufis, man, not only do they have a complicated relationship with Islam, in the same way that hoodoo has a complicated relationship with Afro spiritual tradition. Right. Uh, but, but, but so, but they had this like, man, they had all these wisdom tales. So I started rewriting their wisdom tales okay. in an African American cultural context. And oh. then I said, well, fuck, you know, if I was the, in the old days, I would be restricted to the wisdom tales of my culture, but I am in a global culture now. So right. I, I can use wisdom tales from any culture around the world as yeah. part of my wisdom tale legacy anyway. Um, yeah. And so, you know, and, and, and so that's where I started calling John Killings the Baba John, because okay. all through the Sufi traditions, they'll have these wisdom uh, ancestors and they give them titles. Yeah. So you mentioned that uh, you call him my boy John Whiteman. I would say in some ways I come from <laughs> I come from the lineage of John Whiteman. Him like I come from John. Yeah, I mean from John Killen. Yeah, I wonder, uh, and I really wonder if not uh, if we're not uh, maybe you, I, John, John Killens, if we're not writing a a new Bible like. Uh, uh, we're writing a scroll like all of these books are part of a new Bible and. It's, who knows, maybe in the future they'll be combined and people will see them as uh, being in conversation in some ways, you know? Well, I, I would absolutely agree with you, man, except, I mean, and that's why the books that I teach in my literary hoodoo class are all books that I want to intertext. Okay. You know, The Cattle Killing, Mama Day, uh, The Healing by Gail Jones. Right. Um, you know, and some mumbo jumbo, you know, right. some other works. And um, and I mean, I want to intertext them because I think of them as what you just said. Right. But now in terms of being a, a biblic work, I think it's got to be creative nonfiction. Okay. Fiction works on a different level. You know, yeah. and right. I mean, fiction is my heart, but I don't expect to immediate change through fiction. You know, if you put that on fiction, man, it kind of kills it a little bit. Okay, I see what you're saying, right? Uh, in terms of the, in terms of the, the social goal of changing, of transforming society, transforming their people, right? I believe that fiction, I, I'm saying that in terms of immediate, you know, and I'm saying immediate like a couple of generations. Right. <clears throat> but in terms of long distance change, in terms of shaping generations, I'm, we talking fiction in the okay. same way that mumbo jumbo shaped my generation. Right. right. Um, and, and, and I believe that, um, what was I going to say about fiction? Oh, I don't know. But, but let me say this. I forgot what I was going to say. But let me say that fiction is my heart, man. You know? Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, nonfiction, you put the hours in, you get a product. Yeah. Fiction, you put the hours in, you might get a product, you might not. Right. You know, finally, you just say, fuck it, I'll take this. <laughs> right, right, right. You work, work at it for so many years, especially with novels, you know. Yeah, man. But and you I, are. If you do those big old novels, you be doing, dog. Well, yeah, they just take too long. But you you are working on a memoir, are you not? Yep, yep, yep. And how is that going? You know, okay, so I've been working on my novel and that holy book for about 20 years. Yes. You know, on and off. And not on and off, but I alternate. And so uh, it took longer than I possibly thought it could. Anyway, and so the last, you know, and like for a while, my agent would send the work out and the industry be like, oh, we don't know what to do with this. Yeah. So for a while, she wasn't even sending it out. I'd turn it in and she'd be like, hit it again. Okay. And she always wants me to be more, uh, you know, obvious. And I want to be like. <laughs> okay. 
All right. <laughs> you know, I trust her. I, I do what she say do. I try. You know, right. so she find, so the last time I turned it in, she was like, you know, and it takes a a month or two to get back to me. You know? Right. So uh, so I always and I tell my students, look, don't sit around waiting for the industry to get back to you. Just just put the, you know put that shit out of your mind and work on something else. Right. So I started working on this memoir because I turned 70 this year in the middle of the damn pandemic, you know, and, and feeling, and, and at the time when I started working on it, I was like, ooh, you know, if the COVID catch you, it'll give you about three or four days for it kill you. Right, <laughs> you <know>? right, right, <laughs> right. You know, and at the time it was like it COVID catching everybody, you know. Yeah, so like, oh, yeah, for sure. Man fucking work done, you know, and I've been working like a fiend, because, you know, I, there's things I just, and so I got the novel done to a point where I turned it in, and and because I was in, like, COVID woodshed, you know, I right? In, and Ellen got back to me about a month later, she said, ooh, you know, we ready to go. I said, no, we're not, Ellen, I, because while, while waiting on her, I started working on this memoir, and I was like, okay, I'm just going to do a draft you know, the most right. of the notes, you know, but man, the shit started getting so good to me. It, it got good to me. Uh, <laughs> you know, I mean, I went through my 20 years of blogging, you know, and it was like, wow, you know, and you see what you're obsessed with over and over and over. <laughs> and, right. uh, and how many times you thought, okay, this book's going to make a difference, you know, and then it didn't, you know. Anyway, right. uh, anyway, um, and I have just been immersed in who I am and my history and what I'm about. And I'm a metafictional writer. I said, Ellen, I got a deeper novel in me now. Okay. Uh, I, I'm just a different person. I got a deeper novel in me now. I got, because one thing about going through 20 years of blogging, man, I found material for about eight books. Oh, wow. That's you amazing. Know? Yeah. Uh, I mean, you know, just, I mean, I found some material for so many books, you know, it's like, God damn, you know, I need another 20 years, my Lord. Right, right, <laughs> right, right. Whoa, whoa, whoa. <laughs> and so, uh, and so, uh, anyway, so now, oh, and, and because, you know, my flash fiction thing, I'm writing it in, in paragraphs, you know, okay. flash fictional beats, uh, with a title for each flash fictional beat. And because of the fact that I'm all obsessed and immersed in all this wisdom tale stuff, each one has become like a wisdom tale. Oh, cool. Well, it'd be great to see some of that. And we're actually publishing uh, some of your um, work in the magazine. So uh, for yeah, Tank, Tank, Tank. Came out, that came out the novel in the holy book, the, the memoir still raw. Yeah. Well, it'd be nice to see some. Well, we'll, we'll be seeing it in the future. Oh, yeah. So, Oh yeah, I, it might be my best work. It, and it's so funny because you know how you, sometimes you feel like all you do is write the same book over and over and over. Right, right, I know <laughs> what you mean. And, uh, Maybe and, we're always writing the same book. Yeah. yeah. Just the same obsessions. Right, exactly, right. And, uh, and so, uh, and I feel like, damn, you know, it's the same material that I've used so many, a lot of it, but, it's a lot of it. but this time, instead of me being like, doing Jared, you know, just declarative, get on the soapbox stuff. Right. You know, I'm a 70 year old man in weird times looking back over my life. Well, it sounds good. I think we've talked enough in this. <laughs> I'm sorry, I did all the talking. <laughs> no, I mean, it was great. It's been fantastic. So I think we should end with you hitting and, and thank you, Arthur. Be okay thank you, with my that. brother. Yeah. And, um, <laughs> Before I start doing this last piece, let me say that how do I say this? Me and Jeff go back a ways. We do, indeed. <laughs> we we I'm sure we knew each other before PLF. We did, but it was during PLF, putting PLF on that we became brothers. That was our conference we did together in Ghana in 2008, Pan-African Literary Reform, yes. And I should talk about it, you know, because uh, it was really a wonderful experience. What, yes. what we did, and it was mostly Jeff. Jeff was the vision. And what we did was we, and NYU let us use their campus. Yeah. 
And what we did was we made it open to any African writer who could get there. That's right. And we had a campus and dorms there for them. <laughs> That's right. Oh, it was a wonderful experience. We had writers from all over the world, all over the African world and the yes. diasporic world. We sure did, yes. And I remember when a whole busload of Nigerians came down. That's right. <laughs> that hope, a guy got bought them. Yeah. Hope brought a whole busload. <laughs> yeah, whole, he brought the whole bus. That's right. And we had such a wonderful time. We did. We went, we had a ceremony at W.E. Du Bois's house. Yeah, that was amazing. Yeah. <laughs> oh, it was an experience. Oh, and then we went to Coco B. <laughs> that's right. That's right. And it was Muhammad that hooked all this up. That's right. Muhammad Nasuhu Ali. Yes. Our brother, the writer, Ghanaian writer. I am flowers of the Delta clan, flowers in the line. In the old days, bro, rabbit, bro, alligator had that smooth, pretty skin. Thought he was better than everybody else. And one day, brother rabbit come hopping down the trail and he said, good morning, bro, alligator. And bro, alligator, he look at his watch. Or rather, bro, alligator, he raises his long nose up in the air. Act like he don't see Burr Rabbit. Now everybody knows that you own that. this Burr Rabbit. So Burr Rabbit decide he gonna get back at Burr Alligator. And the next day he walking down the street and he looking at his watch and he's saying, I'm late. I'm really, really late. Now everybody knows you don't ask no rabbit talking about he late, what he late for, unless you're ready to go through the looking glass. <laughs> but Bray Alligator, he's a curious man. He said, where to, Bray Rabbit? Bray Rabbit said, uh, I'm going to meet trouble. He said, surely you know trouble. He's a big man in these parts. He owns all the land. Bray Alligator said, no, I don't believe I know him. It sounds like somebody I need to know. You mind if I tag along? Bray Rabbit said, Joe, where ain't the family? Woo, such a mean rat. So he takes the alligator family down by the riverside, that big field down by the riverside. And he said, y'all wait right here. I'm going to get trouble. And he goes over to the other side of the field and he starts a great big fight. And the alligator family, they can see the fire. They can see the red, yellow, and orange leaf of flame. But you know, sometimes trouble comes packed up and comes packaged in that pretty red, yellow, and orange package. And instead of getting out the way, they said, Dad, don't trouble look good. Don't trouble look fine. So they're waiting on trouble. And they're waiting on trouble. And after a while, that fire's got them surrounded. One of the alligator children said, I believe, I believe, I believe that I feel trouble deep down in my soul. And I believe, I believe, I believe, I believe we need to move. We need to move. And they are right next, right next, right next to the water. But to get to the water, 
they must go through the fire. Alligator family, they scoop through the fire and they get away. But they get all scorched up. And until this day, when you see Bra Alligator, he gonna have a wrinkled up skin. And when you see Sister Alligator, she ain't gonna be too far from the water. alligator children they will tell you don't don't go looking for trouble not unless trouble comes looking for you now into each life there must be trouble because otherwise Otherwise, don't nothing grow. But you know, God don't give no burden that you can't carry. And it is only through adversity that you will ever know your true strength. So when the hard times come, and they always do, I want you to hold on, you must be strong. Because if you fight the battles, friend, that nobody else could win. So the next time that you find yourself in trouble, I want you to remember what the cold blues doctor said. Now every goodbye, it ain't gone, cause you're sick, it don't mean you're dead. And Lord knows that trouble don't last always. Trouble don't last. So when you come to the crossroads, always take the highway. Always strive to be greater than you are. And when you need me, you just call me. You just call me. Hey, you just call me. I will come. May your days be full of passion and may your life be full of grief and may your work serve many generations. You know, may God's blessings be, may God's blessings be, God's blessings be. Thank you, Arthur. Thank you, Arthur. Uh, this is another interview um, conversation as part of Taint 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 Magazine. The magazine has been delayed until January the 15th, but we will be publishing it that day, which of course is Martin Luther King's birthday. So it seems to be a very appropriate time to do the magazine. 
So thank you for doing this production for Tank, Tank, Tank.